All right, we're gonna. This is one I, I do this usually ever so often. Uh, some of you may seen may have seen some parts of it before, but it's not a bad idea to review it. And uh, you know, uh, metal is basically courage, fortitude, uh, position or temperament, man of fine metal. Uh, one of metal. In other words, you've seen it before. Whenever they're talking about sword fighting and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but uh, basically, what we're looking for in any, any kind of a industry is, uh, you know, it was a little blurb that I read in uh, the most recent Motor Age article that came out. The most motor, the motor age issue was in January, and uh, the, the guy that was talking about, uh, you know, whenever you got somebody, he's, he's talking to shop owners. How do you know that you've made a bad hire? You know, they got to have it in there. They got to have head, heart, and hands. In other words, some people don't have the aptitude for this kind of work. You know what aptitude is, right? That you sort of just get it when you look at something. And then heart is what your attitude is basically if you're going to be somebody that enjoys doing the work. He was saying, he was interviewing a guy one time and he says, uh, that guy says, well, what do I get out of this? He goes, you get the privilege of working here, okay? <laughs> I mean, this is like, what's in it for me? You know, this kind of thing. And so uh, the other thing is hand. Has you got the tools? You got the tools to do it? You got what you need? And all that. That is a couple little quick thing. It's not, mine doesn't cover those exact issues, but it's sort of like that. If I can get this thing to cooperate with my... There it goes. There it goes. It's trying to be a little slow. Look, we have a white screen. Isn't that wonderful? All right. There we go. What in the world happened there? I'm not exactly sure. From beginning. Resume slideshow. The, uh, this computer is not near as fast as it want to be. I could just about do it this way. That's here. All right. Now, number one. Uh, and this is, a, this is from a boss man perspective. And I count on your guy, you know, whoever you are, put your name in this plan to be at work every day, on time, ready to go to work. Uh, as they can, as they go say, have he, has he consistently shown up for class all the time, and does he stay all day? You know what I mean? Uh, there was a guy that I worked with uh, over in uh, Dothan, and he actually would disappear every Thursday because he had all his time made by Wednesday. He would show up on Friday to get his paycheck, but he almost never came to work on Tuesday, on Thursday. <laughs> you know, and they get tired of that, and he'd be counting on to go right to work in the morning. As soon as he goes to work, I mean, can he get, you know, you go to work or does he roast some peanuts in the microwave first or waste time standing around drinking coffee and all that? This one guy that's working at a, a dealership over there uh, said, told me, he said, uh, you know, you told us about the people, these water cooler warthogs that just stand around and shoot the bull all day. You know, and, the, and if you're a commission mechanic, they're the ones crying because they didn't make any money at the end of the week. And it wasn't because they didn't have work to do, it's because they didn't do the work because they were socializing. You know what I mean? That's the thing on that. How long does it take him to get started when he gets to work? Uh, how does he do it in work without supervision? Finish what they start? How does he get solving problems? Does he follow directions? Does he stay on task? Y'all are all pretty good at that. Right? Now you struggle a little bit with that engine you put in the HHR. Right? And all that. So, uh, but basically, uh, I can't rest when I got a job like that going until I get it done. You know what I mean? And we got kind of put off by the, having a couple of weather days last week and all that. And that was what Michael was talking about. You know, I said, you know, how'd you do on that? You know, he said, well, it, it's a little more difficult to learn something when it's been like a week since you've worked on it. <laughs> but occasionally you'll have to wait on the parts that long. Like even in a real world job, you know, they'll have to say, you'll, you'll start on a job and you'll be waiting on parts and you'll have to pull off of that job and get, a, you know, get started on another one. And you may have to get back on it a week later after they finally get the parts in. You know, so get used to that. Now the smart thing to do is to bag your bolts or separate them some kind of way. So you, how many of you run into trouble when you put it back together when you got just a big pile of bolts over there? Don't know where they go. Don't know where in the Sam Hill they go. You have that? You ever have that? That's terrible, isn't it? But yeah. if you put them in a bag and you remember, you know, these are the ones for the manifold, these are the ones for, you know, this, that, the timing covers here and all that. And uh, what, you know, if you ever work behind somebody that takes the bolts when they're pulling them out and they screw them into the hole where they go, I work behind a guy like that putting an engine back in when he had to put a crankshaft in one. Easiest guy to work behind I've ever worked behind. 
every bolt was screwed, you know, a few threads into the hole where it went. I didn't have to find nothing. It was just, I just, everything just went, fell back together so pretty and all that. Follow directions and stay on task, you know. Is he honest? Do I have anybody here that's dishonest? Raise your hand if you're a thief. We don't have anybody like that in here, do we? We have had, believe it or not, in the past. All right. Are you prone to leave things loose? I'm talking about this one guy I had one years ago, several years ago. Uh, every he made the same mistakes over and over and over. He worked on Joey's truck, left radiator hose, hose clamp loose. I said, "What's up with this? You leave that loose, it's going to blow off. There, we're going to lose all our coolant." Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So he tightened it up. And uh, next time he worked on a truck, he left the same clamp loose again. What's up with this? You know, and he would leave wall drain plugs loose. I mean, you had to really, really, really watch that guy. You know. Does it leave grease on the fender, seats, carpet, steering wheel? You can do every job right and leave half of a dirty thumbprint on somebody's fender and they'll never bring their car to you again. <laughs> I ain't kidding you, that's the way people are. You know, they used to actually give us this stuff at the, uh, from the dispatch office and it's Malco cleaner and we would clean the windshield. I mean, a lot of times we would clean the steering wheel and the, and the turn signal levers and all that kind of stuff and so it would be cleaner when they came to pick it up than they were when they brought it. You know, so, you know, the, the fender covers are good, the seat covers, the steering wheel covers, the floor covers, you know, it's just really good. People don't like greasy footprints on their carpet and all that kind of stuff. Um, you use the customer's car radio for your own personal stereo. Turn the dadgum radio off if you don't have to be working on radio. Now, on my truck, for right now, it's got only one speaker works. You know what I'm saying? So if you're having to work on the radio, that's one thing. But I saw a guy get fired one time for, you know, he turned it, he had the customer's car, that both the doors open, he was doing some fast service work. And he was playing the radio wide open on his own channel that he picked. And the customer heard that noise and went out there and saw that it was his car. And he threw such a scream and fit at the service manager. The guy fired the guy <laughs> listening to the radio. Because he was actually using the guy's, the poor customer's car for his own personal stereo. That's not right. All right. Is work done quickly and efficiently? Slow and sloppy? Part of it. Don't be slow and sloppy. You've got to be quick and efficient. Uh, socialize a lot with other technicians that are working most of the time. This is fundamentals of automotive technology, and it also fits with a lot of other stuff. Does he have his own tools, or does he borrow a lot of wrenches? How organized is his toolbox? We got a real organized toolbox here, don't we? Hide your head. All right. Oh, so 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 they go look in your toolbox to see if it's organized. You're going to be a lot more efficient if you don't have to hunt your 15 millimeter socket. That's the point. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you what. If you roll a toolbox in there and it looks like a tornado hit it, they're going to step back. You know, say, wait a minute. You know, how kind of how how good is he going to do over here? You know. There was one guy, though, that had a brand spanking new snap-on toolbox. This tall, this wide and that tall. I don't know how much it was worth. I mean, just slam full of tools. And whenever he got through working on this one car that he had over, and he, a lot of this kind of stuff he did, he was a new guy. I don't know where he came from, where he got his training, where he got his tools. He probably had $50,000 worth of tools. And uh, he left this solenoid swinging by the wires and the hoses when he got through working on it. Because they, they would give him, take him, you know, he was doing something on it, and he gave it to me. And I said, why did you leave a solenoid swinging by the wires and the hose? He goes, oh, that's the way I found it. Really? Aren't you a mechanic? I mean, you're supposed to put it back like it goes. Don't leave it like I found it. Well, it was leaking oil when it came in here, so I just left it like that. You know, I mean, think about this. You know, see what I'm saying? You're supposed to put it back like it's supposed to be. Anchor all the wire harnesses, make sure that everything's like it ought to be as much as you can. Uh, does he have about everything he needs? I used to have one guy that I worked with, and he would come over there. Every time he had to change a fuel filter, he would come and borrow my fuel line tools. And I say, Robert, don't you have fuel line tools? Well, I just want to borrow a fuel line tool. Don't give me a hard time. So wait a minute, the tool truck comes every day, and you got a really nice, expensive toolbox over there. It wasn't as big as that other guy's, but it was like this. And he said, oh, I, he said, you're just giving me, you're just, you're just, you know, messing with me, you know. I said, no, I'm not messing with you. I said, if you're going to do this kind of work, you need the tools. This is fuel line tools, man. You know what I'm saying? How many times are you going to you take fuel lines loose? You know, like the thing y'all did, had to take the fuel line loose? You know, get you some. They don't cost really all that much, right? Because they committed to add new tools to one of the already owns. Uh, whenever, and it, you got to be smart when you buy your tool money too. Like if I was uh, find myself in need of a, of a, I cut my teeth working. My dad had a Volkswagen shop, and he had a lot of standard and metric tools, and he knew which ones would go either way, right? A lot of people throw off on that, but you know, like for example, you know, a half inch is close to a 13, a 14 millimeter is close to a 916, so 
19 millimeter close to a three quarter, 17 millimeter close to 11 16 you know what I mean? Well, one of them, there's some that's right there stand alone. A 10 millimeter you can't use for nothing else to do a 10. A 15 is all by itself. 16 same as 5 8 pretty much, an 8 millimeter same. Okay, but I needed an 18 millimeter wrench. When I went out to the tool truck, I didn't go out there and buy a whole set of wrenches. I just bought an 18 millimeter wrench. Went to the Cornwell truck, bought one wrench. You go to the snap on truck, you'll pay $50 for one wrench. <laughs> it's pretty stupid. You know what I mean? But I just bought what I needed. You know, I mean, I, everything I, if I reached in my box and I didn't have something I needed, I was going to go find me a way to get it. That's the whole thing. All right, keep your work area clean. You know, if you got greasy crap all over the floor and you got your air hoses rolled up and all of a sudden the cords everywhere and all that so that you can slip and fall really easy, you can look at somebody. Some people take a mess with them everywhere they go. You know, work with people. Like, it's take a big mess, you know, all kind of junk. They got to, you know, just turn their place into a junkyard. All right. Uh, you keep it, now, if you got a, a greasy mess somewhere, you need to clean it up just as quick as you can. You know what I mean? Like, if it's your service bay, you know, and if you can, you know, get the boss man to provide you some stuff to clean it, and usually they will. You know, say, I need to be able to, you know, clean up these these things. You know, occasionally they'll have somebody that'll come around and do the cleaning up for you, but that don't usually happen. We had one that, uh, one of them $6,000 machines at the Ford place for a while that would go and they would scrub the floor with it. You know, the one that's got the brushes and sucks the water up and all that kind of stuff. He used it for about nine months and wore out a brand new and just, you know, it broke down. Uh, but, you know, basically you're responsible, you need to be responsible for keeping your own area clean. But to keep his drop light and air hose rolled up and out of the way when he's not using it. You know, that's a good thing to do too. He said, have no All right. Uh, do they use jack scan, grinder shield, safety glasses? How often does he injure himself? Is he safety conscious? How often do we got to send you to first med or wherever because you got something in your eye? Or you know, slash your hand open. You're going to have accidents occasionally, you know. I mean, I've actually injured myself a time or two. But if you injure yourself because you're not using the personal protection equipment, then that's on you. Of course, they'll usually get you seen about and all that kind of thing, but it's a good idea to keep your eyes covered up. You know, I'm always hammering on the safety glasses thing, and I wear mine all the time. Alright, got soft skills. Got to stay on you and pester you to get you to do something right or finish your job. What are you doing over here? Get over there and get your work done. What you, how come that job's not done yet and you're the one that's supposed to be doing it? They got three lined up behind it, you know? You know they got to keep riding you all the time? Yeah. Did you know how much it costs to put somebody to work? This friend of mine owns a shop and he says when he hires somebody to put that guy boots on the ground and doing the work, it costs him a thousand dollars. Before you turn a wrench, when he just hires you, when he decides you're hired, if he sets to set up your workman's comp and all that stuff and he's got to get set up, he's got to get off a thousand bucks. He's got to write a thousand dollar check to put you to work. And then some people will go to work somewhere and they'll work there for two days and they say, yep, I don't like this job, I quit. Well, you just cost the guy a bunch of money. You know what I mean? Now that's why people are, some people are so careful who they hire because they want to make sure they're hiring somebody that's going to earn them back that thousand dollars and a lot more. You see, it's not just as simple as like a revolving door, you know, I'll hire him if he don't work, you know, and usually you got to do pretty bad before they fire you, you know. And they stay busy even when you're waiting on parts between jobs. Now, whenever I was, the way I was getting paid over there, when I was in the field before I came here, I was the one that fixed the battery chargers, and mounted the fans on the wall, and kept stuff done, kept the computers updated, blew the dust out of them, updated the shop manuals. You know, I wanted to make sure that they knew that they were, you know, paying me for something I was doing, and I wasn't sitting around with my feet propped up, you know, chewing bubble gum or something. You know, yeah. Uh, can you get along with people or well or a troublemaker? There was a guy one time that went to work over there and he actually eventually went up into fast service work. His name was uh, Willie. And he went around the shop. When he first went to work there, he had a lot of personality. But he worked at uh, 25 mechanics in that shop. And he started on the other side of the shop. I saw him working. And every time he came to somebody's stall, he'd make them mad. He'd say something to make them mad. You know, he'd t get them ticked off. And so uh, I, saw, I watched him do that. And I was listening to what they were saying. People get mad at him coming around there. And whenever he came to, to, my, to my bay and he started sweeping over there, I said, you look pretty uh, hot and bothered. Why don't you let me buy you a soda pop? Well, I guess I could drink one, so I bought him a soda pop. He didn't try to make me mad. <laughs> <laughs> I headed it off. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I knew he was going to, he was trying, he was deliberately aggravating people to make them mad just to get a rise out of them. And when I bought him a soda pop, you know, I put a little guilt trip on him so he didn't try to make him mad. <laughs> Being able to get along with other people, I went to, you know, the, somebody was telling me one time when I went to work at a place somewhere, they said, this guy right here, this, this service manager, he'll stick it to you and he'll, he'll give you a hard time and he'll take your money and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I went in there and sat down with him one day and I said, you know, 
they told me that you can't be trusted and you'll take me money and I'll take my money and all that kind of stuff. And I says, but I kind of took up for you when they said that because you ain't never done like that to me. And I think you're a good guy. Well, after that, man, he wouldn't do nothing to me for nothing because he wanted to hang on to that image. You know what I mean? Because I told him, you know, I was, you know, and he I really did. He treated me right. You know? <laughs> Would you hire him if you were opening your own shop and he was going to be your only employee? Think about this. If you had a shop, based on you know your work, you know what your work ethic is, would you hire yourself if you were somebody and he was the only guy? I put one guy to work. Well, he wanted to work in the town where he lived. So he went to work down there at a place in the town, a little shop where in town where he lived. He worked there three months. And after he worked there three months, and that guy that owned that place saw all that he could do, that guy fired everybody else and kept him. That guy's daughter was working for him. His own daughter was working for him. He fired her too. <laughs> and he kept this guy. And at, and at Christmas time, he bought that guy a brand new cobalt toolbox. They had a radio made into it. Because that guy was worked so hard and got so much work done that he didn't need nobody but him. And he told him, it's going to be me and you. That's all we need. you know. And paid the guy. And I asked the guy when he came up here, I said, how you doing? He said, man, I'm making a lot of money down there. He said, I'm doing it. Because he knew how to work. Now, when he was here... And it, I don't usually have time for this, but I taught him how to work. You know, basically, because he would, if you told him to do something, if he didn't want to do it, he just wouldn't do it. And I wrote a little story, and I let him read it, about having an interview with somebody who wanted to hire him, and, I say, and they asked me questions. Does he do what he said? Well, no, if he don't want to, he don't do it. All that kind of stuff. And when he read the story, you know, he was all huffy and mad and everything. But I got the point. People want somebody that they can tell to do something and not even worry about it being done. You know what I mean? If you tell him to do it, all you got to do is just walk away. And when you come back, it's going to be done. That's what kind of people are looking for. Right? 13 best practices. Try not to borrow any tool more than once. You know what I mean? Now, sometimes the shop supplies the tool. You know, like expensive scan tool, something like that. But if, you, if, if it's a, something as simple as a wrench or fuel line tools or something like that, <laughs> I, I can tell the story. This guy that was a, kind of a hillbilly named Donnie Smith. Uh, you know, I can say that name because there's a lot of Donnie Smiths out there. And he had a big old beard and he talked like a hillbilly and all that. And I said, uh, he's over one day rooting around in this other mechanic's box. And I said, what are you doing in, in Philip's toolbox? He said, I'm going to buy my cellar home. I said, uh, what happened to your cellar home? You an engine mechanic? He said, my brother borrowed my cellar home. He didn't give it back. I said, why don't you get your brother by the beard and jerk him around? He goes, how do you know my brother had a beard? <laughs> I couldn't I imagine him not having a beard, you know. <laughs> anyway, this guy right here. Don't start screwing an important bolt or plug into his hole and walk away thinking you'll remember to tighten it later. Spark plug, oil drain plug, oil filter. You know, you, you start this plug and you just got it started. And there's somebody, hey, Joe, can you come help me with this? Oh, sure, no problem. Then you come in, let's see, where I was? Oh, yeah, I was going to pour the oil in it. And you got the drain plug halfway in there. See what I'm saying? See where the problem is? I'll leave the drain plug out because I'd rather see the oil run on the floor when I pour it in than have it come out going down the road. You got me? Put yourself a hedge somehow, you know. If you hadn't finished screwing that spark plug into that, leave a spark, leave an extension on it and it's sticking up out of the hole. See what I mean? I mean, don't set it up, don't set yourself up for failure. Always make sure that you have built a hedge to keep yourself out of trouble. And uh, any of that kind of stuff. It's one day this guy named Robert uh, was uh, working in a body shop and uh, over there. <laughs> this is another funny story. So. He needed to look and see where the trunk seal was leaking. So he got in the trunk and he told this guy, he'd go, uh, have a flashlight in there while this guy closed the trunk. And he's watching the seal of the flashlight while the guy wets it with a hose. And then he says, um, somebody says, hey, Bob, you got a phone call over here? And he says, I'll be back in a minute, Robert, I got a phone call. So he goes over, yeah, hello, uh-huh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'll meet you for lunch. Hey, guys, I got to go, I'm going to lunch. Robert's in the trunk. Let me out, let me out. An hour and a half. <laughs> He's in the trunk. And the guy comes like, oh, no, I forgot about Robert. <laughs> Robert. And they're about to die. I think he's going to be, you know, like the mob done got it. All right, so, anyway. Don't leave any vehicle with a dry crank case or bad brakes without disabling the vehicle so it can't be started and driven. Okay, we don't have the oil yet. We got the oil drain plug. We got the oil filter on. We'll pour the oil in it after lunch. You don't come back from lunch, somebody gets over, somebody that doesn't happen to be a person that's going to pull the dipstick, cranks it up, locks the engine up, because you left it in a bad way. Or if the brakes ain't working. Remember the story I told you about the guy that disabled the brakes? 
somebody came in here, got in it, managed to get it in drive, ran over here, knocked the car off the lift because this other guy didn't say nothing to nobody about it. But if you pull the key out, disable the vehicle somehow, pull the key out, put a big note on the steering wheel, don't start this car. You know, I mean, something. Best thing you do is pull the key out and put it somewhere where they can't find it. Where's the key to this car? Well, I got the key to the car. You know, or if you're working on a hybrid vehicle, you need to put that little fob somewhere 30 or 40 feet away so that when you drain the oil out, it ain't starting the motor up to try to charge the battery up. You know what I mean? It does all kinds of stuff like that. When you're parking a customer's vehicle outside, don't leave the windows down even if the weather's clear. And look up and see if it has a sunroof. Hello? If you roll the windows up and the sunroof's open and it comes to rain, there's one lady came back over there after somebody parked it outside and she splashed into about that much water in the seat. Well, she's going to shoot somebody, man. <laughs> man. She was not happy. But anyway, think about it. This is a customer. If I'm parking this thing outside, one day uh, this, this student parked the, the Sonata outside with the windows down, put his key in his pocket, went home, didn't come back the next day, and it rained. If you put the trainer car key or somebody else or somebody's car key in your pocket, think about that. That's the worst of all worlds. You know, he put the key in his pocket, took it home, left the car outside with the windows down. You know, that's why I got these little uh, things on the door. That little sign right there. If it's parked inside, leave the key in it. But don't leave, don't, you know. If you're going to start a car somebody has walked away from, make sure that you know what they were doing. You know what I mean? Be really, really careful before you pull the dipstick, check the coolant, all that. You know what I'm saying? Make sure. Um, when you're doing a, an oil change, along with another service operation, complete one operation before beginning the other. I don't know how many times I've seen people raise it up, drain the oil, put a plug back in it, put the filter back on it, lower it halfway down, do a tire rotation and balance, and they're just about to start the car with a dry crankcase. Do you know anybody that's ever done that? Started a car with a dry crankcase? That's pretty darn scary, isn't it? We don't want to go there. Bad idea. Oh. So finish the oil change before you do the tire balance and rotation. Or finish the tire balance and rotation before you can start the oil change. But don't mix and match those, man. You'll forget things. It's a bad scene. Um, just, you know, whatever. Being a, a good mechanic doesn't give you a license to be a jerk. Just because you've started to climb up in the world and people do, you know, if you get to where you're better, there's always people that know stuff that you don't know. I'm a, I want a couple of Facebook pages where people uh, share their experiences and all. And uh, you'd be surprised what people will teach you just listening to the mistakes and the errors and the stuff that they've learned from the job they've done, all that kind of stuff. And I'm always open to listening to somebody else's experience. Also, two heads are better than one. You know, if you're having trouble figuring something out, say, hey, come over here and see if you can put your head together. And sometimes I'll call Donnie and talk to him or he'll call me, you know, and, you know, we'll actually bounce stuff off of each other. Sometimes from a distance you can see it better. Don't plunder in the console or the glove box of the customer car to see what they got in here. One day about two years ago, you know, this is supposed to be a gun-free campus and all, about two or three years ago, this guy come over here and says, he was all, he says, there's a gun in that pickup over there. And I says, leave the gun alone and fix the truck. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> it ain't a big deal. You know, he was just like, ooh, you know. So whoopee. I used to see those cars. This one old guy from, the, uh, from his bank down in Florida would come to the Ford place with his Lincoln. And uh, he had a gun under the seat. He had a gun here. He had a gun in the glove box. He had a right shotgun in the trunk. And he had a crowbar back there. He's going to take somebody out. <laughs> you know? He was an old man, but he was a banker. And, you know, if they put him in the trunk, you know, when they opened it again, he was going to be ready, I guess, or whatever. But, I mean, he had an arsenal in that doggone car. And I had to pull all the seats out and everything because I had to run some wires back there and put a CD changer in it and all that kind of stuff. But, but the thing about it is, you know, leave their stuff alone. You know, now sometimes I'd have to pull the console out to get to the uh, shifter, shift interlock or something like that. And when I do, I try my best to put their stuff back neater than it was, you know, put it in a cardboard box and put it back. At least as much as like, well, you know how hard it is to stack the stuff back in the glove box that fell out when you had to open the glove box to get behind it and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes, you know, they put it in there one piece at a time and it settled. And then whenever it's all flopped around all over the floor, it's hard to put it back in there like it was. You just kind of want to stuff it in there and slam the thing and all that. But uh, don't take any of their ashtray coins or their chewing gum or anything else you think won't, they won't notice. You know what really used to get me? I mean, I, I ain't going to take no money or nothing out of anybody's car. 
But you know, whenever you just kind of would like a piece of chewing gum, you'll see one of them 16 packs laying there, you know. You kind of like to have a piece of that, but it ain't right to take it. And it seemed like every time I sat down there, there wasn't none missing out of it, or maybe it was just one piece, or it, there was only two pieces left. You know, if you take <laughs> if you take one, they're going to see it. But it ain't right to take it anyway, so you shouldn't even do it. You know what I'm saying? And But, but there was a guy... Uh, and there were, I knew of more than one person that got fired for taking change out of people's car. Quarters and stuff they'd have in a cup or in their cup holder or something like that or in their ashtray. You know, they couldn't keep their hands off the other people's money, you know. And, uh, and that's just, you know, that's the way it is. Some people that work at a bank or a convenience store, you know, they start embezzling money like that. And it's a good idea to leave all that stuff alone. Don't change the radio station. Turn the radio off if you don't like what's playing. Or even if you do like what's playing, turn the radio off because you may get distracted. You may be like Nick over singing. <laughs> when you replace something like a water pump, glue the gasket to the pump instead of the mate and surface. It makes things easier for the next tech. In other words, if it's a gasket that has to be glued because it won't stay in place otherwise. I don't even like using get sticky stuff on gaskets unless it's something that's just tacky enough to hold it in place. A lot of times if I can put it together without that, I will. Uh, but if you have to glue it on there with some of that Gorilla Snot, you know, that yellow 3 m weather drip adhesive or whatever you're going to use, or glue, glue it to the part that's going to be pulled off and replaced next time, or the part that's going to be easier to clean, the engine block. You know how you're scraping the gasket, how you're making the disc, get all that off where it's perfectly smooth, where it won't leak? If you pull it, if you if the part you're pulling off is what the gasket is stuck to, that's a good thing. Always respect the next tech and work to make things better, easier for him or her. The next tech might be you. Now, if you've ever you say, well, I'm just going to cram this in here, the next guy will have to worry about it, and then the car for you know two months later comes back, and you got to take all that crap apart again. Ooh, you know, I wish I'd have done this a different way. All right, don't dress like a slob if you want to be considered professional. You used to see people, professional mechanics, you know, big old loopy uh, tank top shirts and all in the summertime and all that kind of stuff. These one people at his motorhome came in there, and they said, the last guy that worked on our vehicle didn't even have any patches on his shirt. <laughs> well, that's the same thing. That doesn't mean you're a better mechanic because you got patches on your shirt. But if you got credentials, wear them. You know, and look like a professional. You know what I mean? What do you think about this? If you're going over here to have some work done, and somebody that's going to do the work for you comes out and looking like a slob, you know, I mean, look like they've been, you know, flip flops and shorts and <laughs> tank top shirt, and they're supposed to be your mechanic. You know, what do you think about that? Doesn't really seem to line up, does it? Okay. All right. Now that you're bored out of your skull and want to go to lunch, there you go. Three. All right. Didn't even have a test. <laughs>